Kolegice i kolege, dobar dan. Hvala što ste se okupili, što smo se okupili, što ste došli danas, bez obzira na ovu hladnoću. Današnji povod našeg sastanka, kao što ste vidjeli, je predavanje profesora Aleksandra Maksela, našeg osta sa seučilišta Viktorija iz Wellingtona, Novi Zeland. On je predavač povijesti istočne i srednje Evrope na tom seučilištu. Evo, konkretno, ja nisam mogo zapamtiti cijelokupe naziv, dakle, sastavnice seučilišta School of History, Philosophy, Political Science and International Relations. Trenutno predaje na, dakle, trenutni kolegi koji predaje na seučilištu jesu narodi Sovjetskog imperija, so people of the Soviet Empire, a interes njegovo istraživanja jest u osnovi Hadburška monarhija i zemlje sljednice Hadburške monarhije, nacionalni preporodi, dakle, u Hadburškom carstvu, u Ruskom carstvu i u Osmanskom, dakle, carstvu, svakodnevni život u Evropi i nešto što je meni osobno bilo onako zanimljivo, jer nisam stvarno o tome puno ne znam, a to je lingvistički nacionalizam i povijest lingvističkih ideologija. Današnje predavanje koje će nam održati tiče se, dakle, kao što vidite, 1848. godine, neću što je u našoj historiografiji dosta, dosta se o tome pisalo, ali evo ga sad jedan malo drugačiji pogled, dakle, pozicija Slavena i Njemaca unutar, dakle, tog, dakle, nekakvog mađarskog nacionalističkog korpusa. Ne bi, evo, pretjerano duljio, pa bi propustio reći profesoru Maksimu. Hvala. Dobar dan. Za prvi molim dva prostite, zašto u Hrvatskoj ne budu mluvit. Ne govorim dost dobře pro vjedecko vjeci, ali vam se sam šlo svoje fragne v Deutsch stelen volim, da su sam se hercih angeladen. I'd like to talk today about nationalism in Hungary in the 19th century, which is a topic of long-standing interest to me. One thing we have to say about the Hungarians of the 19th century, whatever faults they may have had, they did not lack a sense of patriotism. They were very enthusiastic about their nationalism, and I have done a lot of work on, uh, on various aspects of that patriotism. I found this poem from 1848 in the patriotic magazine, Honda Rue, uh, and it goes down and lists all the things that a proper Hungarian should do. He should only drink Hungarian wine, only eat Hungarian food, and so on and so forth. Many of the things mentioned in this poem have become research interests for me. I have published, for example, that the Hungarian should only marry a Hungarian woman. And, uh, and what is the consequence of this national endogamy that if, if a Hungarian marries a German, then what happens? It's very interesting. Uh, I've done some research on the Hungarian clothing, because a proper Hungarian doesn't wear any sort of foreign fashions from Vienna, that's some sort of unpatriotic act. And uh, so I have a chapter in my forthcoming book on, uh, on Hungarian clothing. I have uh, published on Hungarian wine, or actually have an article under review, haven't published on it yet. And I've published on some everyday Hungarian um, symbols uh, that aren't listed in this poem. It's very patriotic to grow mustaches. So I have published on the Hungarian patriotic mustache and so on and so forth. But the The most important of all these things that a proper Hungarian should do, the most important thing listed in this poem, is the Hungarian language. A proper Hungarian only has one language to speak in the mind of the Hungarian patriot, which is the Hungarian language. Now, the problem with that is, as you can see from the ethnographic map, that uh, a large um, population in Hungary doesn't speak the Hungarian language. Now, it's, a, it's one thing to say to, uh, to people, if you really want to be a patriot, you should wear this shirt instead of that shirt, or you should grow a mustache instead of shaving. Those things are easy to change. It's very difficult to say to someone, you should learn as your native language a language that you don't even speak now. That's uh, a much more difficult thing. And so this policy that they have in the 19th century to turn all Hungarians into ethnic Magyars caused a lot of, uh, of problem, as I'm sure everyone in the audience already knows. Now, the policy of Magyarization, as it was called, is uh, remembered very bitterly 
in the Slovak national historiography. I found this, uh, this uh, book that symbolizes this, this terrible suffering. Modernization, the picture of the Slovak suffering. And you see how terrible it is that the landmark in uh, Bratislava should have a Hungarian flag. What a terrible tragedy that would be. Uh, of course, it was perfectly normal in the 19th century for the capital of Hungary to fly the Hungarian flag. Uh, but so what I'd like to do uh, to start off with is to examine how Slavs in the Habsburg monarchy, Slavs in Habsburg Hungary, responded to this policy of modernization. Uh, because the response that you find in the 19th century texts is a little different from what you expect it to be given the 20th century experience. The basic idea is that Slovaks responding to modernization um, <coughs> try to distinguish between the Hungarian and the Magyar because they want to say, we are Hungarians too. We must make a distinction between the Ungarn and the Magyarin in this text, originally in German from Johann Czaplowicz. And the idea is that you should be both Hungarian and Slavic at the same time. And you can see actually in the way he signs his name just how much, how seriously he takes this idea of uh, crossing the boundaries. The, Jan Chaplovich's name begins with this ch sound. So he writes with this ch hacek, c hacek. But he also does cs like a Hungarian. See that? He's mixing his orthography here to show that he's both Hungarian and Slavic. But the point is that uh, you can be an Ungarn, you can be a Hungarian, if you're a Slovak, if you're a Romanian, if you're German. All of these people together can be Ungarn. So I am just as much a, as an Ungarn as the Magyars. Here's another text saying basically the same idea. The author was compelled to distinguish between the Magyarin and the Ungarn, between Magyarish and Ungarish. Why? Because he wants to say that he, as a Slav, is just as much a Hungarian as the Magyars are. Who do these Magyars think they are to claim a monopoly on what it is to be a Hungarian? I'm just as good a Hungarian as you. Now this, of course, is not the rhetoric you find in contemporary Slovakia. Not the rhetoric you find in contemporary Vojvodina in the Serb population. I doubt you find people in, uh, in uh, Bratislava today who would say, I am a Slovak and just as good a Hungarian as my anyone in Budapest. But the point of this in the 19th century is to say, we are Hungarians. And should we become Magyars? The answer is, no, we should not. This is not unique to the Slovaks. <coughs> I found this source just yesterday in the Academy of uh, uh, Arts and Sciences Library. It's not only the Magyars who achieved great fame for the Hungarian crown, but also we Serbs, also we other nationalities. So even in uh, other, Slavs, other Slavic regions of the monarchy, you find this insistence, we Slavs are Hungarians. Maybe not what you expect, given 20th century politics. Now this distinction between the Ungar and the Magyar becomes universal in all uh, languages of the monarchy, except for Hungarian. The Hungarians always insist we are Magyars, and everyone is a Magyar. I don't understand this distinction between Magyar and Ungar. This is some sort of hair splitting. I don't understand it. Everyone else seems to understand it just fine, though. So you make this distinction in all of these languages. And uh, you also have the experience that uh, the word for Hungary changes from the 19th century to the 20th century. Here's a, uh, a Hungarian text saying that Hungary, Uhorsko, ended in 1918. What comes afterwards is not Uhorsko, but Magyarsko. And there was an attempt at the Paris Peace Conference to try and persuade English speakers and French speakers that they should no longer refer to Hungary, but only to Magyaria. There's no more Hungary. Hungary is dead. Only Magyaria. The uh, British and the French and the Americans decided not to do that. They, the, the Czechs were not successful in persuading uh, English speakers and French speakers to change the name of Hungary. But the attempt was made, and this distinction was made in other languages of the monarchy. Now the whole point of trying to conflate Magyar and Ungar, to say that there's only one type of Hungarian, is maybe uh, well expressed in this Serbian passage from the same text I cited just two slides ago. Uh, the Hungarians want to argue that in the Hungarian nation, 
there is only one nation. Uh, in the Hungarian land, there's only one nation, one big state for that one nation, and this one nation will overwhelm all the tribes of that nation. And I think the vocabulary is interesting. The distinction between the nation, Narod, and the plemina, the tribes. So in this text, which is a, uh, a caricature of what the author thinks the Hungarians are arguing, what the Magyars are arguing, there is one Hungarian nation, and then the constituent uh, groups inside that nation, uh, Slovaks, Romanians, Magyars, Germans, and so forth, they are not nations, but plemina, or tribes. Now, the, the idea of a single nation with constituent parts that are not nations is indeed something you can see in Hungarian texts. Here are three different Hungarian formulations of what is eventually called the Magyar Politika Nemzet, the Hungarian political nation. So three different texts from three different time periods, uh, one from the revolution, one before, one after. This is the infamous Nationalities Law of 1867. Uh, but what you can see when you read the text is that uh, they define the nation, Nemzet, as all the citizens of the country, regardless of language, ethnicity, and so forth. There's only one Nemzet, only one nation. And the constituent peoples inside, well, they are not nations. They are Nemzetishegek, they are Volker, they are Nepfajok, something that isn't a nation. Because there's only one nation, is the Hungarian nation. If you are a, a proud Croat, if you're a proud Slovak, if you're a proud uh, Valachian, that Croatianness or that Valachianness is not national. It is racial or tribal or something that isn't national. The Slovaks in Hungary develop an alternative theory that I call dual nationality. They accept the political nation. They don't fight it, they accept it. They say, yes, we are part of the Hungarian politiski narod, but we have to distinguish between the political nation and the linguistic nation. That uh, inside the political nation, there are the following genetic nations. And so uh, different texts in Hungarian history uh, from Slovaks are articulating this different idea of being part of a Hungarian nation. Now, this is not what you expect Slovak patriots to be saying. You expect Slovak patriots to be saying, we oppose the 10,000 year tyranny of the evil Hungarian oppression because that's the way Slovak patriots talk after the First World War. But before the First World War, the Slovak patriots are always talking about their pride in Hungary, their loyalty to Hungary, their love for Hungary, but simultaneously, their pride, loyalty, and love for their uh, ethnic nation, their political, na their genetic nation, their linguistic nation, whatever it is. I um, went through various uh, highly detailed differentiations between the Hungarian nation and the Slavic nation, however formulated, and it looks like this. So for example, in uh, Daniel Lichard, he says the political nation, which means Hungary, is united by laws and politics. Whereas the, uh, the, the Slavic nation, it is characterized by its language, its customs and habits, and because they inhabit a common region. According to Lichard, this is what distinguishes the two. And you can see that the, the different authors trying to distinguish the political nation from the not political nation, the genetic nation, or the linguistic nation, or whatever that other nation is, they don't always agree. You can see that Zmertich thinks that customs and habits are shared all throughout the political nation. All the ethnicities of Hungary share the same customs and habits. Whereas for Lichard, the customs and habits is unique to the individual uh, ethnic group or linguistic group. But they all agree that the political nation has the same laws. The Slovaks accept the Hungarian parliament. They accept Hungarian law. But at the same time, they insist that their language should be protected and that their language is national. There's something national about speaking a Slavic language, and even though we are members of the Hungarian political nation, we insist on this, uh, on this, unique, nation, on this unique language. Now, why is it so important, this distinction between uh, the political nation and the ethnic nation or the linguistic nation on the one hand, and between the political nation and a, a tribe, or a Nepfai, or a Volker on the other. Why is it so important? Everyone accepts the political nation, 
Everyone accepts there's uh, constituent groups inside that nation, but those constituent groups, are they also nations or are they tribes or something else? It's important. And the reason it's important is in the 19th century, the word nation acquires this magic power that the nation legitimates political demands. If you can say, the nation demands that, something, something, something. Whatever that is, it's a legitimate demand because the nation demands it. A race, or a people, or an ethnicity, or a Nepfi, or a Volker, cannot legitimate demands in that way. And you can see the importance of the word nation very explicitly in the discussion that Kosciut had with Stratomirovich in the early months of 1848. Stratomirovich led a delegation of Serbs from the uh, Vojvodina to speak with Kosciut in, um, in Bratislava, then uh, Pojon. And they had a discussion and they did not come to an agreement. But at one point in the discussion, they came to what they felt was the, the key disagreement between them. Kosciut said, there is no nation of Serbs. In Hungary, there's only one nation, the Magyarische nation in the German, the Magyar Nemzet, and everything else is merely a Volksstamm. So the Serbs cannot be a nation, they're merely a Volksstamm. Can a Volksstamm claim political rights? No, only the nation can. Stratomirovich didn't take that line down. Die Serben sind eine Nation und werden selbst mit äußeren Mitteln ihre Rechte verteidigen wissen. How did Kosciut respond? Das sind die Worte eines Hochverräters. Und dann kann nur das Schwert entscheiden. Those are the words of a traitor. And only the sword can decide between us. Was Stratomirovich intimidated? Ladies and gentlemen, he was not. He said, if you want the war, you are going to get it. So people are willing to go to war over the status of Nation versus Volkerschaft. It's a very important thing. So this is why there's this theoretical disagreement in the nationality theory between uh, nation and peoples, nations and nationalities, which is what the Hungarians argue, or nations and nations, nations and nations. Now I think part of the reason that the Slavs of Hungary are relatively unsuccessful in defending their rights is that it takes them a long time to work out the uh, terminology of defending two nations simultaneously. This dual nationality that there are, we are a member of the Hungarian nation, but also have a Slavic nation, that takes a while to work out. And if you look at the sources from the early 19th century, you can see that terminologically they are very confused. So this is Samuel Hoytze's Apology of the Hungarian Slavism, and here is the relevant text where he refers to the two different nations that he talks about. He says, uh, uh, the meaning is very clear. Since the time of St. Stephen, there is uh, only one nation in Hungary, indivisible whole, and uh, we, we, the Slavs of Hungary, are just as much loyal Hungarians as any employee of the Pesti Herlap, which is Kosciut's patriotic paper. But then when he gets theoretical, he gets all confused. He says, we have, to, we have to be very clear about our terminology. We have to look very carefully at the following words. Volk, Volkstümlichkeit, Sprache, Nation, Nationalität, and Vaterland. So, people, peopleness, Volkstümlichkeit. Anyone have any suggestions? Tricky, huh? Nation, nationality, and fatherland. And how does he distinguish them? Well, uh, if you look at the text, he sees that uh, the German, he says, the Volk, or Nation, uh, and uh, by nation he means Hungary as a whole, and by folk he means the constituent parts of Hungary, so Serbs and Germans and so forth. But when he looks at other languages of the monarchy, he gets confused, because he makes the same distinction between folk and nation in Latin and in Hungarian, and he does so in Slavic as well. And he distinguishes between the narod and the narod. Does that distinction look very clear to you? The only distinction is, the Hungarian political nation is a capital N. So we are members of the Hungarian capital N nation. And we are also members of the uh, Slovak lowercase n nation. Do you think that sounds useful in a political speech? Can you imagine someone running for parliament? We must fight to defend the lowercase narod. I think it's not such a good political, uh, political differentiation. 
And with such bad terminology, no wonder they have trouble articulating uh, their demands in a theoretical way. M. M. Hoxha, another leading Slovak, he has uh, equivalent trouble with terminology. In his Dobro Slova Slovakum, the, a good word to a Slovak, he distinctions between, he makes a distinction between narodenstvo and narodenstvo. Did you hear that? Narodenstvo and narodenstvo. Aha, we have short and long vowels in Northern Slavic. Huh? You Croats are lazy. You don't distinguish your short vowels and your long vowels. Ha ha. The, the distinction between the narod and the narod leads him to the insane sentence. Not every nation is a national nation. narod, narodi narod. Because some narodi are merely narodi narods instead of narodi narods. Oh, who can make politics on the basis of the short A versus the long A? Catastrophic terminology. And this is how the Slovaks are formulating their national sessions before the 1848 revolution. The, sh the quotations I gave you earlier with the political nation, linguistic nation, political nation, genetic nation, those are from the 1870s. So in the 1840s, this is how the Slovaks are talking. And you can see why the, uh, the Magyars maybe don't find it so persuasive. But in terms of the political goals, in terms of what this terrible rhetoric is trying to accomplish, then the Slovaks are very clear. The Slovaks have the right to nationality. We're not going to let the Magyars monopolize the rhetoric on nationality. We do not want to Magyarize. We want to remain by our own language and our nationality, which legitimates the nationality, in our own homeland, Hungary. So notice the loyalty to Hungary pervading all this rhetoric. Very complex theories of nationality designed to contest what the Magyars are saying in order to claim Hungary. Not a Slovak territory, not a Slovak nation state, but their rights inside Hungary. Ludovic Stur, the great Slovak hero, is absolutely clear. We Slavs are devoted to our country, meaning Hungary. From the earliest times we have served Hungary, but we have always fulfilled our obligations as Slavs. And so we want to enjoy our rights in Hungary as Slavs. Now in this text, Beschwerden und Klagen der, uh, der Slaven in Ungarn, by Stur, which he writes, by the way, as Ein Ungarischer Slava, that's his pen name, a Hungarian Slav. He lists uh, several examples of what he calls illegal Magyarization. He says, in such and such a town, a Slovak man was singing a Slovak folk song, and some Hungarians told him, stop singing that foreign song, you, you pan slav traitor. This is illegal. We must fight these instances of illegal Magyarization. Now, all these instances of illegal modernization that he mentions, he says, in such and such a town. So I took the liberty of putting those towns on a map. Would you like to see what the map looks like? This is where illegal modernization is taking place, according to Ludwig Sturz, Beschwerden und Klagen der Slaven in Ungarn, 1843. Please notice that it does not describe any ethno-territory. It is not that we want the right to speak Slovak in the Slovak territory, but rather all through Hungary we have the right to speak Slovak. We have the right to speak, Hungary, Hung uh, speak Slovak in Pest, in Kishkoros, in all these places deep inside the Hungarian ethnic territory. Absolutely clear, his homeland is Hungary as a whole. Now, uh, Hoxha and Stur, despite their uh, proclaimed loyalty to Hungary, um, make themselves very unpopular with the revolutionary government of Kossuth. And indeed, all th uh, both of them are mentioned on this wanted list. These are people who are wanted for treason. The first name is Horban, who I haven't talked about. But Hoxha is second and Stur is third. These are the, the, the traitors wanted by the Hungarian government, and here's how you recognize them. All three of them have to flee the country. And Stur and Hurban then organize a, uh, a revolutionary army to fight against the Hungarian government. They're not particularly effective as armies go. Jelicic is, is a much bigger player in terms of the fighting in 1848. 
But it is this important moment in the Hungarian memory that they rose up, took up arms to fight the Magyars. Retroactively, <coughs> Slovaks remember this as the, the prototype of their, independent, of their independence. And Stur and, uh, and Hurban become sort of proto-George Washingtons or proto-Mazzinis who fight for an independent state. But I would suggest to you that Stur and the, and the volunteers are not fighting against Hungary, but are fighting for Hungary. They're fighting against Kossuth for a different vision of what Hungary, Hungary should be. They're fighting for a multi-ethnic Hungary where they can speak their language as much as anyone else. So this is my new interpretation of the, uh, the, the Slovak movement in the 19th century uh, for Hungarian rights in Hungary. Instead of seeing them as proto-George Washingtons, maybe we should see them as would-be Martin Luther Kings, as uh, people leading a civil rights movement. Let's now turn to look at the Germans and how Germans living in Hungary responded to the modernization. They were equally skeptical. This text comes all the way from 1795. Uh, discussion about important things in the Austrian monarchy. In Hungary, the population is very mixed. No other country in Europe has so many nations speaking so many languages and so many dialects as Hungary. And it is a very strange idea that they should all learn Hungarian. The, the non-Magyar speakers outnumber the Hungarians three times. Who do the Magyars think they are? So a very uh, similar sort of thing that you might see in a text written by a, uh, by a Slav. The distinction between Magyar and Ungar is taken up by the German authors. Here's a book, The Magyaren und andere Ungarn, The Magyars and the Other Hungarians, implicitly claiming that there are lots of Hungarians who aren't Magyars. He has a very interesting uh, moment in this text <coughs> where he, uh, he is speaking German to a Hungarian that he meets and he says, oh, well, you Magyars this, you Magyars that. The man gets very angry and says, don't you call me a Magyar, I'm an Ungar. Because he doesn't want anyone making this distinction between Magyars and Hungarians. And Lohr says to him, I thought it was your very pride that you are Magyars. And now you're ashamed? And that puts the Hungarian on the wrong foot. He says, well, yes, for ourselves we are Magyars. But for everyone else we are Hungarians. The Hungarians don't want to, they want to distinguish Magyars and Ungarn. They want everyone to be a Magyar. They want to conflate the idea. The rhetoric is often copied directly from, uh, from Slavic texts into German texts. Thomas Vilogoshvari here, this is actually a pen name for a Slavic author. I don't know who it is, but I know he's a Slav. It's another one of these national defenses as Jan Ormish calls them, defending the rights of the Slavs of Hungary. And he calls it the Sprachkampf von Ungarn, the language war of Hungary by uh, pen name for a Slav, published in, uh, in Croatia. The Germans respond with a very similar article, the Sprachkampf in Siebenburgen, the language war in Transylvania. And this is written by a, a Transylvanian Saxon. This is all about the evil of modernization for the Slavs, how the Slavs suffer from this evil modernization. And this is about the, the Germans in Transylvania and how they suffer from the evil modernization. The, the rhetoric is almost copied directly, uh, in, at least in the title of the book. Here's another book from the 1840s. Hungary is a source of fears and hopes for the future of Austria by Dr. S, whoever that is. Dr. S says things that are very familiar to us at this point. Look at all of these non magyars in Hungary. The Magyars only make a third of the population. We non magyars have rights. There is no Hungarian city without a German population. We Germans have rights. But what's interesting about this particular text is he includes the Slavs. What Germans and Slavs do for Hungary, they do as Germans and Slavs. I think that the Germans of Hungary are reading what the Slavs are writing and thinking it makes sense. And that's kind of interesting. Most of the studies you read about uh, how ideas are transferred in Eastern Europe, you read that the, the ideas are all formed in London and Paris, and then they go west. And people in Eastern Europe 
read what the great thinkers of London and Paris are thinking and are influenced by it. There's a civilizational slope, and the influence goes only in that direction. Well, in that civilizational slope, the Germans are higher up than the Slavs. But here we have the Germans seeing what the Slavs are writing and thinking, well, that makes sense. I should copy that. And it makes perfect sense given that the Slavs are writing their national defenses mostly in German. Stur wrote in German, Hodger wrote in German, uh, because they're trying to reach the Hungarian audience, and German is an important language for inter-ethnic communication in Habsburg, Hungary. So the Germans are very well able to read what the Slovaks are saying, and they seem to find it persuasive. So much that this, basically a book that written to defend the German rights, includes the Slavs as someone else who also suffers from this terrible illegal modernization. So I think that's interesting that uh, here the, the Slovaks and the Croats are working as, as the, the instigators of an idea that then spreads to the Germans. It's true, though, that the Germans do not feel the same sense of urgency to fight uh, modernization as the Slavs do. And it has to do with the fact that Germans are in a more privileged position. Here's a, um, a, a, a picture showing all the, the wonderful landmarks of Budapest. And one of them is, of course, here, the, uh, the Hungarian theater. But you notice that it's written both in Magyar and in German. There's no Slavic in this picture. German is the international language in Hungary. It's the, the, the language for tourists. It's the international that you would speak. So it has this sort of co-equal status with Hungarian in a way that the Slavic can't compete. <coughs> Furthermore, you can see in the same poster, there's also the German theater of uh, Budapest. It's also there uh, as, a, as a landmark. There isn't a Slavic theater. The Germans are wealthier and they have connections up the Danube to Vienna. German is an important language in the monarchy as a whole. The Germans are more um, comfortable than the Slavs are because they have more resources more to fall back on. For the Slavic intelligentsia, the modernization is a very serious threat. Germans don't feel as threatened. So now I'd like to discuss how these things, how these ideas play out in the 1848 revolution. And I'm going to particularly look at the Germans in 1848, because um, <clears throat> I think the story of Germans in 1848 is, is less well known. 1848 revolution in, in Hungary is sparked immediately by the 1848 revolution in Vienna, which in turn is sparked by events in Paris. <clears throat> But there's this key moment in Vienna where the students riot, barricades go up, there's a, a tense few days, Metternich flees, and then the revolutionary moment has happened. So here's a picture of the revolutionary moment, and you can see all the new National Guardsmen wearing their cockades, and they're uh, looking at the handbills, and they're buying the newspapers, and they're now free from censorship. A very exciting moment. But you can also see in this picture the Hungarian. Can anyone see the Hungarian? With this mustache? I really like that picture. I think it's funny. So when the news of these events reaches Budapest, it so happens that it reaches on the, the nighttime ferry, and the day following is a day of a fair. So peasants are all in from the countryside to sell their goods at the market. When the news arrives in the middle of the night, a whole bunch of Hungarian hotheads and patriots uh, are so enthused that they spend the whole night in a cafe writing a, uh, you know, patriotic manifestos and speeches and so forth. And Chandra Petofi, the, the great poet, writes this very famous poem, the national song, Nemzeti Dal, Talpa Majar, Ita Zider, Moshvat Shoha, Rise up, now is the time, we will not be slaves. And then in the morning, they uh, stand on some local balconies and they uh, gave these speeches to the huge crowd of people coming in for the market, and that's how the revolution begins in Hungary. Now, uh, where are the Germans in this? Well, Budapest has a large German population at this point. Uh, they're, in the early century, it's even predominantly German city. So when these patriotic speeches are being made in Budapest, many of the speeches are given in German, because the revolution is supposed to, at this point, include all the peoples in Hungary including the Germans. So the revolutionary crowd of the March days in Budapest is a multinational crowd 
with the nationalities living inside Budapest, namely Magyars and Germans, both participating. In the early moments of the revolution, in the early months, there is a, a sense of great joy between Hungarians and Germans, particularly the brave students of Vienna who had taken the, the initiative in kicking Metternich out. And there's a moment where Guido Caraccione, it's a great name, isn't it? He's the, he's the head of the Music Lovers Society in Budapest, and he organizes this grand ball for, uh, to honor the German students of Vienna for having overthrown Metternich. And he gives a speech at this grand ball, and he says, the sons of Arpad, the Magyars, and the sons of Tuitso, meaning the Germans, can joyfully embrace their revolution has come and let us all be brothers, and everything is going to be wonderful. All, you know, disagreements are behind us. Hooray, hooray. So this is what the revolutionary moment is like, with explicit claims to German-Hungarian friendship. There's one group of Germans in Budapest who are so excited by the days that they found a patriotic society of the Germans in Hungary. Here is a sample speech, as reported in Morgenröte, which is a, one of the uh, revolutionary newspapers published in Pest. And so here are the members of the Revolutionary German Society of Budapest talking about how we Germans in Hungary are Hungarian above everything else. Yet, we do not wish to forget our language. That's a very familiar type of rhetoric, isn't it? Our love of the German language does not set us against the Hungarian language, but it's our language. We need to discuss the events of the day in the language we know. Now, according to Mergenröte, this magazine where I got this from, there was a Hungarian in the audience who sat in the corner and listened carefully to see what the Germans were saying. And at the end of the evening, he stood up and he paid his membership dues to show that he supported their initiatives. In the early months of 1848, the German-Hungarian relations, german maja relations are, are very good. Another uh, <coughs> poem from Morgenröte by Ludwig August Frankl tries to claim a Germanness to the Danube itself. The, the river that runs through this, the Hungarian capital, springs from German hearts. It has its source in the German land. The Danube, which is a Hungarian river, is also a German river. And so, too, we can be both Germans and Hungarians. And this is even more explicit in, in, in another passage. The Tisa is Magyar. The Drava is Slavic. But the Danube is mostly German, even in Hungary. On this map, the Germans are this sort of light, uh, light uh, uh, green color. But you can see that there are German communities settled all along the Danube from the uh, new, new settlements built during the wars with the Turks and after the wars with the Turks. So the Danube is a German river, in the same way that the Tisa is Hungarian and the Drava is Slavic. See, all the different nationalities of Hungary have their own unique homelands inside Hungary. We each have our own characteristic river. And they claim the Danube for the Germans. Now, 1848 affects more people than just the, uh, the patriots of Budapest. When the news reaches the Serbs in Vojvodina, they are also very excited. And this is a... Uh, Actually, probably everyone in this room knows this picture, yes? This is the, uh, the, the, the Serbs proclaiming a Serbian state in the lower Vojvodina, which the Hungarians do not take well. This is where Stratomirovic finds himself going up to, uh, to uh, Bratislava to negotiate with Kossuth. But how do the Germans respond to this? Between Slavs and, uh, and Magyars, maybe the, the distinction is clear, but for patriotic ethnic Germans living in Hungary, what's the response? This is a letter from a, a German who lives in the Banat, and he says, the Germans will stand up as a single man, and we will cry our wealth and blood for Hungary. Down with these Slavic anarchists and, and robbers and plunderers and so forth. We German Hungarians, we who own house and land here in Hungary, we who were born in Hungary, we cannot be anything other than Hungarian. So the, Hungarian, the Germans living in the Banat side with Kossuth, or at least this man, sides with Kossuth over the, the Serbs. Now the Hungarians are not necessarily uh, so keen on the Germans. Uh, there, there does get to be a certain degree of tension because uh, it becomes clear that there are still forces in the Habsburg monarchy that are Kaiser Troy, that are loyal to the old regime and very suspicious of this newfangled revolutionary talk. 
so this is a picture of a uh, Hungarian soldier, but it's a Hungarian soldier who is an ethnic German. And how can you tell? Well, if you look at the picture as a whole, you can see that he's a Hungarian soldier with German legs. You see that? The part of him is it's Magyar is strong and manly. And the part of him that's German is, is not. So there's a, there is a sense of chauvinism in Hungary as well, that these Germans, even the patriotic Germans who support us, even patriotic Germans who enroll in the Hungarian National Guard, well, they're not true Magyars. But when the push comes to shove and the Habsburg armies actually march into Hungary, then what's the situation like? Well, the Pashta Zeitung, and this text is written under the, um, the well, the situation in Budapest is as follows. Uh, the revolution happens, and then in uh, early 1849, a Habsburg army takes Budapest. And then the Hungarians retake it, and then the Habsburgs re-retake it. So it changes hands these three times. So this is in that first Habsburg occupation. The revolution has just been defeated, but the armies are still out there, and they are going to come back. So this then, in that period, is a German man complaining about modernization. These Magyar hotheads, they want to Magyarize the German merchant companies in Pest. And all these proper Germans, when, what's the problem? You send them to Hungarian schools and they stop saying vivat, they start saying alien instead. They lose their language. We can't have this. We have to uh, fight Magyarization and remain German while we live in Pest. If we have more pride in our Germanness, we will no longer be pariahs. The German in Hungary will be as respected the way his language and literature should be respected. So we have a sense then a more confrontational attitude. We are Germans. We defend our language against the unjust uh, impositions of the, of the Magyars. Since the days of St. Stephen, German hands have achieved much in this country. Look at all the hard work we've done. Look at what we've achieved in this country. Our hard work and our accomplishments in Hungary give us the right to say that this is our homeland, even if we speak another language. Every people deserves honor, and jedes Volk is Ehrenreich. And so we honor you, the Hungarian, but you should honor us as well. Because we are all equal. We all earn our living here. We are not beggars. We didn't come here for charity. We came here to work. And look at what we've accomplished. You should respect what we've accomplished. So uh, a German poem published in um, in a Pesh newspaper in the Pesh Zeitung in this intervening period. So uh, then, as I say, the Hungarians reoccupy uh, Budapest and then are kicked out again. Uh, there's a lot of fighting in Budapest. It's very tense. A lot of people are killed. And eventually the Hungarian uh, armies are completely defeated. And here's a, uh, a famous painting of the, the, um, the martyrs of Arad. This is the Hungarian leadership that the Austrians catch and they're all, uh, they're all killed in a firing squad. So what about the Germans in Hungary in 1850, after these tense events? The, there's a lot of ethnic tension in 1850 in Budapest, with the, the imperial armies occupying the country, and uh, the Hungarians sullen, defeated, and angry. How then do Germans in Budapest talk about their, the situation then? Here's Handbuch zur Kenntnis Ungarns, and it says, Ultramagyarism, with its exaggerated aspirations, has received its death blow, and good riddance. But in the future, the Magyars will learn to understand that we can only have Hungary with a brotherly attitude. And all the nationalities, all the peoples of Hungary will come together, and we will, we will be reconciled. So this is vision of the future. All the splendid buildings of Hungary. This is a German achievement. We'll look at all these wonderful things we've done. We will achieve, achieve recognition for the German contribution to Hungary. Uh, and so the Hungarians will be compelled, if they won't agree willingly, to acknowledge the German contribution. And this, uh, I think this is my last, last main text that I'm going to look at, one of the final texts. Gustav Höfkin. He writes a book about uh, why Germans should emigrate to Hungary. Now, the idea is too many Germans are emigrating to America. America is too far away. Let's have them come to Hungary instead. That's the purpose of the book, uh, to try and get people not to emigrate to America. 
So come to Hungary. And why? Well, Hungarian Slavs, Romanians, and Germans are powerful in their unity, and they will create a durable confederation based on equality between peoples. See, now that the Magyar uh, chauvinists are defeated, we will have a multi-ethnic Hungary where everyone will be equal. We Swabians, we Germans fear nothing, because in the future we will be strong, and thus we will have the national reconciliation between the different nationalities in multi-ethnic Hungary. So it's sort of similar, I think, to the Slavic idea of the Ohersky Plinsky Narod. Hungary is a homeland for all these different nationalities at the same time. Now, uh, I think this idea of um, German nationalism in Hungary being directed towards a multi-ethnic state is interesting. And it certainly violates, uh, certainly contradicts what you can read in historiography. Here's a text I found discussing the significance of the 1848 revolutions and the coming of age of German nationalism. And for this author, the coming of age of German nationalism leads to pan-Germanism, leads to German ethnic nationalism, not a civic nationalism that's tolerant of different ethnicities, but an ethnic nationalism that's, that's very terrible, and that that ethnic nationalism will lead to the crimes of Nazi Germany. You see how German nationalism goes straight to Nazi Germany. Well, I just showed you a different type of German nationalism. I showed you a German nationalism that's all about a civic Hungary. It's a nationalism about being a proud German and a proud Hungarian with other Hungarians who are not Germans. A multi-ethnic, multi-culti nationalism. So it's a different vision of what German nationalism is all about, I think. I think it also foreshadows the Ausgleich pretty well. Here we have our German and Hungarian, and we are all good friends now. But uh, the Ausgleich then leads to the, the other conclusion that I want to draw from this story, which is that the Slavs are not happy with how the Germans behaved in 1848. Hoja, who we encountered earlier in a, in a previous text, this is what he writes in Prague in 1848, when he's driven out of Budapest as an exile. He says, you Germans, you shook the blood spatter hand of the Magyars. You united with the Germans to destroy the Slavic Congress. What are you doing? Why have you betrayed us? Here's another uh, Slovak text from the 1848. Hungary is not just Magyar. Any look at a map can show that. So far, so normal. But you Germans, you, you Germans are, receive a special privilege from the Hungarians. Fejnes Eilek is a, a noted Hungarian patriot. He's very active in the Schutzverein. And he wants to exclude the Slovaks. There's a moment in the revolution when uh, all the populace should be armed. There should be national guards and everyone should have weapons. But not Slovaks. Only Germans and Magyars should receive arms. You two are jointly behaving like a master, master race, and you want to leave us in a, in, a, in a situation of slavery. The Germans love the Magyars, extend the hand of friendship, but only to the Magyars. They should be more friendly to the Slavs. Before 1848, I think there's a lot of convergence between what the Hungarians are saying and what the Slavs are saying. Magyarization is bad. There's lots of non-Magyars in Hungary. We should be more equal. But after 1848, there's a distinction, I think. The Hungarians have a more privileged position, or the Germans have a more privileged position, and they use that position to make an alliance with the Magyars, and the Slavs lose out. Here is how the Germans and Magyars understand unity. The German and the Magyar will beat up on the Slav, a Slavic position on the, on the Ausgleich. So that's the end of my talk, and I hope you found it interesting. Thank you very much for coming. I'm also ready to answer any questions. I'll take my own questions.
initial findings? Um, I'll try to repeat the question because I know you're recording. Uh, I've come here to Zagreb to research the, this same period from the Croatian perspective. I haven't been to Croatia before, it's all new to me here. Uh, I spent a lot of time in, in Budapest, a lot of time in Slovakia, but not in Croatia, so I'm trying to broaden my horizons on 19th century Hungary. Have I noticed anything in the time I've been here? Well, I've only been here about uh, you know, a month and a half doing research, so I don't want to pose as an expert on Croatian history to this audience, because I know that there's more, many people who are more knowledgeable about Croatia than I am uh, here. But I can say one of the things that surprised me so far, looking at the Croatian sources, is that the Croatian sources I've looked at talk as much about Austria as about Hungary. Uh, I found plenty of Croats who say, yes, our brother Magyars, we must we must rejoin brotherly relationships with our brother Magyars, blah, 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 you know, just what I expect. But at the same time, uh, they're also saying, so therefore we should have our own crown land in Austria. We can have more equality uh, between all the nationalities of Austria if, we, uh, if the, tri the, the triune kingdom becomes a separate crown land equal to Austria, equal to Hungary, uh, inside the context of Austria. The Slovaks never talk about Austria. They're always talking about Hungary. They want to preserve their rights in Hungary. Not as a crown land of Austria-Hungary, but within Hungary, in the context of Hungary. So that's the main thing I've noticed so far. I'm uh, particularly looking for instances where uh, Croats will discuss their nationalism not so much in the high political context, but in everyday life. I've showed you I've done things on uh, you know, you, you show you're a proper Hungarian because you wear the Hungarian mustache, and the Germans don't wear the mustache. I have terrific stories about that. If you're a, a German in the Banat, you don't wear a mustache because you show you're German. But if you are elected to a political office, you become an agent of the Hungarian state, so you're expected to grow a mustache. But then if you are voted out of office, you are expected to shave again. So the mustache politics is very detailed and, and interesting. I was hoping to find things about uh, Hungarians talking, oh, we drink uh, Croatian wine, or a, a Croat saying, we don't wear the Hungarian kalpak, we wear a special Croatian. Mm -hmm. And I um, must say I'm disappointed. So far, I found very little of that. Uh, the Croatian newspapers are very high political in their orientation. They talk a lot about uh, what Jelicic is doing, what's happening in the, in the Sabor. The, the Slovaks don't have a Sabor. So they are talking more in this sort of cultural uh, linguistic sphere that I'm really looking for. So in that sense, my efforts in Croatia so far have not been particularly successful because uh, you're far too high political for my more cultural history tastes. Other questions? Sir? Can I say anything about Jews in the revolution? Um, I only know what I've read from secondary sources as I haven't researched Jews particularly. Uh, but it's my understanding that there's lots of Jews who are enthusiastic about the revolution. And uh, it's my understanding that Jews enroll in the National Guard in the Honved uh, more than any other nationality apart from the Magyars themselves. So they're very keen, uh, which is pretty unsurprising because the main barrier that most non-Magyars feel about the Kosciut government is they're stuck up on the language. And there's plenty of people in Croatia or wherever who are keen on the liberalization and they like this talk of revolution. They don't want to go back to Bach, uh, neo absolutism They don't want to go back to Metternich. But this uh, modernization language policy is a barrier they won't cross. Well, whatever Jewishness is about in 19th century Hungary, it's not about speaking Hebrew. It's not about speaking Yiddish. Jews, more than anyone else, are happy to linguistically assimilate. And the Hungarians, more or less happy to take them on board. So uh, Hungary, well, anti-Semitism is a big problem throughout 19th century Europe. But if you had to choose some place to be Jewish in the 19th century, Hungary is not a bad place to be Jewish. That's my understanding. Other questions?
Gonna gonna have to stop your lecture there um, because you're you know sort of giving a broad history of the 19th century. Um, I think that the the political side of modernization, the common crown land for the Hungarian kingdom, all speaking Hungarian. I think that story has already been told plenty of times. I think it's a well-known story. So I have been more or less taking it for granted in my research and moving on to these these other things. But uh, I want to get to what you said earlier about the uh, Hungarian language not having a distinction between uh, Ungarn and Magyarin. It's interesting to note that in the late uh, 18th century, the Slovak language did not either. If you look at Bernalak's dictionary, he uses the word he gives for the Hungarian language is Uhorcina, the Uhor language. And he doesn't distinguish Uhor and Magyar. The distinction between Uhor and Magyar is a product of Magyarization. It is invented specifically for this political rhetoric so that non Magyars can contest Magyarization. And the authors who invent these words to make this distinction also come up with suggestions for the Magyar language to make the same distinction. So uh, one of the authors I look at, I've forgotten who because it's been a long time since I looked at it, he proposes the word Huniai for Uhorsko. That you can, you can, the Magyar Sag is only the place where the Magyars live, and the kingdom as a whole is Hunia. And the, you could talk about the Huniai Nepek, the, the Nepek of Hunia. And the Hungarians don't go for it. Uh, but they don't go for it deliberately. Uh, and even when they write in German, the language where this distinction is first popularized, the Hungarians affect to not understand, oh, this Byzantine hair splitting. And that Byzantine hair splitting, I suggest, is also a uh, political tactic. Now, uh, a few years ago, I was interested in a thing called uh, linguistic relativity. Now, linguistic relativity is an idea in linguistics. And the idea is, whatever your native language is, it shapes your thoughts. I, as a native speaker of English, think certain thoughts because the, native, the English language constrains me to think them in that way. And someone from Vietnam might have different thoughts because the Vietnamese language structures in a different way. And there's a, a lot written on linguistic relativity, and I can recommend some books if you're really interested. But I made a contribution to the debate by looking at linguistic relativity as a political argument. Because both the Slavs and the Magyars argue that the other is, uh, is, has a fatally flawed view of the politics because of their language. The Magyars say, these crazy Slavs making these fine hair split distinctions that no one, no proper person can understand. Who knows what they're thinking about with their crazy Slavic ideas. I, as a Hungarian, I can't possibly understand. And that's a way of dismissing the Slovak claims, dismissing the Serbian claims as meaning meaningless. I don't need to worry about that. Magyar politika nemzet. The Slavs respond in the same way and say, the trouble is the Hungarian language is flawed. It fails to draw this distinction. We need to teach the Hungarians this distinction by the, this flaw in the structure of their language needs to be repaired. So if you're interested in getting the full story of that, see my published article. Other questions? Auch im Deutsch können Fragen gestellt werden.
Well, then, thank you all for coming. I hope you enjoyed the talk.